Well, uh, as you guys have uh, been here for the last few months, we've been working through a short series on the book of Philemon, and so uh, today will be the final message in uh, that series. And uh, I truly do hope that it has been an encouraging time for you, and I hope that you have been able to supply it in uh, your day-to-day -day life. And uh, as we wrap up uh, this uh, kind of these final verses uh, in this book, uh, hopefully uh, you continue to draw some practical principles uh, in how you uh, live out forgiveness in your day-to-day -day life and how you uh, just interact in all of the various relationships you may be involved in, whether at work or with family uh, or, or with your friends, that you uh, understand how to always uh, extend grace uh, to those around you. So if you guys would join me uh, in opening your Bibles to the book of Philemon, uh, we'll be in verses 17 through 25 today. Philemon 17 through 25. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you, the Lord. Refresh my heart to Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. A pastor to my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends readings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of God. Forgiveness is a difficult topic these days. I'm sure at one point or another in our lives, we've heard the say, to err is human, but to forgive is divine. A phrase that emphasizes that there is exceptional grace and humility that goes into the act of forgiveness. But in our culture today, the idea of forgiving someone is not even encouraged or valuable. In fact, in our culture today, forgiveness is viewed as destructive, toxic, and weak. In preparing for this sermon and even throughout really uh, this whole series on the book of Philemon, I've seen a lot of different opinions and views on forgiveness. I listened to one therapist give a talk stating that forgiveness is not necessary because in one sense, if you absolve that abuser or bully or criminal of their wrongdoing, they will not truly feel guilt or moral responsibility for the wrongs they have done. If they've wronged you, well, they have to live with that guilt. It's only what's fair, after all. Another paper I read by a counselor argued that forgiveness is never the answer, but actually, hate is the answer. And the essence of the paper went like this. If the one that wronged you seek to return that same offense even more strongly to the guilty party, then use hate as your motivator. So if someone steps over you and steals that promotion from you at work, don't forgive them. Channel your hate. Outdo them at every aspect of your job. When the next promotion cycle comes around, you not only take that promotion, you take the position above them. If someone hits you, you don't forgive. You channel that hate into strength. You train yourself. You take martial arts classes, and then you come back, and you punch them even harder so that they know never to touch you again. Forgiveness, well, forgiveness is you just saying surrender. And this might shock you, but to be honest, we see this kind of thing being a teaching manifests itself in our society even today. People are becoming increasingly hostile and bitter. We make movies and admire the quote unquote heroes who are able to act out of vengeance. Crimes of retaliation are now common and considered acceptable today. And we even have lawyers who are trained to know how to bring lawsuits over every kind of misinterpreted act. Even as Sigmund Freud once stated, one must forgive, but not until they have been hanged. If we're real with ourselves, we do not like to forgive, and too often, we do not. Instead, we subscribe to another saying, to err is human, and to forgive, is out of the question. 
And I believe there is a big reason for this kind of thinking or this kind of teaching today. And it's a simple answer. It's the reflection that we are all sinners. Forgiveness is one of those things that just is not natural to us. And for human eyes, forgiveness is not natural. It needs help. It needs motivation. It needs encouragement to bring it out. I mean, if any of us have been wrong, even just slightly, we know that in real life, it's not always as simple as simply saying, I forgive the matters rest. Bitterness lingers and grudges grow. And I think that's one of the many purposes of the Book of Philemon. The Book of Philemon exists to show us the outworkings of the gospel and forgiveness in the life. And particular, particularly, what we will see in these final nine verses today is exactly how do we aid, how do we motivate someone who we are seeking, who is seeking to forgive, especially in a situation where sin has corrupted. And as we see in Paul's final parts in this epistle, there are practical steps as well as spiritual reminders that can how we can take to help spur someone towards forgiveness. Uh, but before we dive into that, again, remind ourselves of the book. Uh, the book of Philemon is concerned with three individuals, Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon. And Onesimus was a slave of Philemon until one day, Onesimus decides that he's going to sin and run away from Philemon's house. But God had plans, even in the midst of this transgression. As he runs away, Onesimus comes into contact with Paul and Rome. And Paul, who was a Roman prisoner at that time, evangelizes to Onesimus. Onesimus hears the gospel, he repents, and now he joins Paul in the front lines of the ministry of the gospel. Uh, and Paul, in God's providence, is also a friend of Philemon's. And, so, and Paul knows that Philemon is a faithful man who loves his church well and deals with integrity. And so when Paul realizes that Onesimus has been Paul decided that he's going to help make things right again. He sends Onesimus back to Philemon, back in Colossae, with this letter, this very epistle we have in hand, asking Philemon to forgive and reconcile. And this is my third and final message, including the other epistle. And in, just to do some brief backtracking, in verses 1 through 7, Paul opens the epistle by praising Philemon's character, understanding that it's his character that leads to forgiveness. My most recent message in verses 8 through 16, Paul gets to the heart of the message, and he makes a series of appeals on why Philemon should forgive. And he lets Philemon know that Onesimus has genuinely changed, that if Philemon can forgive, he's not just receiving back a slave, but now a brother in the family of God. But Paul knows that you can't just leave the matter saying, this is why you should forgive, just sign off. Again, Paul understands and he knows that he needs to conclude acknowledging that forgiveness is a tough matter. And so, as Paul closes the letter in these final nine verses, he provides Philemon with a series of encouragements to demonstrate his support for Philemon, make the decision to forgive. As difficult as forgiveness can be, there are practical considerations to take into account to properly restore relationships. And so as we look at verses 17 through 25, I want us to see five acknowledgments Paul makes to compel forgiveness. Five acknowledgments Paul makes to compel forgiveness. And the first acknowledgment we see is an acknowledgment of material debt. The acknowledgment of material debt. We see that from verses 17 to the first half of verse 19. Beginning of this section, Paul now switches to business terms, which is fitting because Philemon was also a businessman himself. But also, practically speaking, there is a bit of business to be addressed here. So verse 17, he opens the statement with, So if you consider me a partner, receive him as you would receive me. And that term partner is that same term you use when you think of partners in a law firm or partners in a corporation. It's a business relationship. You are both stakeholders in the same company vision. And you both share in the successes and the failures your company together. You both take part in the profits of the losses. And so in using this term, Paul is drawing a metaphor to how they are spiritual partners as well. Philemon, as your fellow stakeholder in the gospel, I want you to take Onesimus back. 
It's not just as straightforward as opening the door again. To stay true to this partnership, Paul understands that on an earthly level, Onesimus has created a debt. And that debt needs to be paid. Onesimus likely stole money from Philemon and has also incurred a huge financial loss simply by abandoning his job. And even though Paul has asked Philemon to forgive, Philemon still fully deserves what is owed to him. And unfortunately, Onesimus, as a runaway slave, probably has no means to pay back or overcome the debt he has paid. So Paul offers a solution. Verse 18, if he has wronged you at all, or owed you, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. In my Monday through Friday, from my 9 to 5, I work as a software engineer for a company that serves as what is called a payment facility. And what a payment facilitator does is that it provides software services for any merchant. Think of like your local coffee shop or your local bookstore. And they, <clears throat> accept, accept payments and trend, and they help those stores accept payments and transactions from their customers. And so, as a payment facilitator, it's always important for our business and reputation that the merchant succeeds with funds. And so one of the guarantees that you see that is common in our industry is that at any step of the way, whether it be a bug in our software or an issue with the acquiring bank, for whatever reason along the path, that money gets lost. Well then, that those funds get charged to our, our accounts. So the merchant stays whole. And that's in a sense how Paul is acting here. He's serving as a facilitator so that Philemon will not suffer any loss at least at a, on, on a material level. If that's what's going to hang up Philemon, Paul wants Philemon to be made whole so that he can respond to his grace. He even guarantees it and seals it when he says, I, Paul, write this in my own hand. Paul is saying, I'm going to take on this legally binding contract to take responsibility for Onesimus' debt. As we saw in verse 13, Paul was already making a huge sacrifice of sending Onesimus back. But now he upped the ante even more, saying he will pay back anything that is owed. And you may wonder how Paul can even do this with himself being in prison. And what's likely is that because of Paul's reputation, he likely had many sponsors and supporters still even with him while he was in prison. And to Paul, money was never a concern. Money was simply a tool to do kingdom work. Paul is fully willing to repay whatever earthly cost was to be incurred. And that is how serious Paul saw forgiveness needed to be pursued. Money's not the issue here. It can mean two people dwelling in the harmony. Paul's greatest desire was to see the household of God living Christ like harmony. So failure to forgive will sadden Paul. It will burn in him. It will tear him apart. Because he wants nothing more than to see two Christians living out the gospel in their own lives. So if I leave it, you still have a right to what is yours. And if you are suffering any losses, consider it done. I will pay for it, wiped out by me. Both Onesimus and I understand that we are asking you a lot to forgive and to take it back as brothers. And to show that, and to show that we understand that, and since Onesimus has no money to pay you back, I, Paul, am willing to pay a loss. And this is a practical principle for us when we apply forgiveness as well. If you ever find yourself in a position where you are seeking forgiveness, you need to show that you are serious about your repentance. And part of that is trying to repay any debt you have incurred. Forgiveness does not excuse your sin. And the reality is that for that sin does cause a lot of collateral damage. It can have far-reaching consequences. And so if it's practically possible, whatever sin you have done must be rectified. So if there's a damage to reputation, go out of your way to repair it. Maybe you have slandered someone publicly. Be sure you retract whatever statements you have made. 
If there's earthly damage, do whatever it is in your power that Paul is doing here. Take it back. If you want the other party to forgive you for your sins, well, you also better try to wipe out any damage you have done as well. Otherwise, how meaningful is your repentance, anyways? And that's what Paul is doing here on Onesimus' behalf. He and Onesimus understand that there's very real loss inflicted. And so they would strive for its reconciliation. Well, they also better strive for its making amends as well. In human eyes, forgiveness is not natural, but sometimes it helps when the other party demonstrates they are willing to restore the loss. That's the first acknowledgement. Second acknowledgement is an acknowledgement of spiritual debt. Acknowledgement of spiritual debt. As soon as Paul makes a commitment to repay, he slips in a side remark here, the latter part of verse 19, to say nothing of you owing me, even of your own self. And this is a reference to Philemon coming to saving faith under Paul's ministry. Remember, Philemon, who you heard the gospel from. Yes, I will certainly pay you back, but in a sense, remember, you also do owe a lot to me. I do not think Paul is doing this to manipulate the situation or to try to guilt or Philemon. But what he is doing is pointing Philemon to his own spiritual debt. Think about, think about it from your own shoes as a Christian. Can you remember the moment you came to save the faith or when you first heard the gospel? Perhaps it came from your spouse, a youth pastor, a sibling, a friend, a roommate, or one of the elders here at this church. They helped bring you the gift of freedom from sin, the gift of knowing Christ, the gift of eternal life. This is not something you can ever repay someone back for. And so, yes, I leave, you are owed something. And don't get us wrong, we will do everything we can to take care of that. But remember, there is a debt beyond what this Onesimus owes. And finally, Paul ends verse 20 with, Refresh my heart in Christ. Earlier in verse 7, Paul talked about how Philemon's character has refreshed him. And Paul again uses that same verb here, refresh. And Paul reminds, reminds Philemon that by forgiving Onesimus, there's also many positive side effects as well. One of which being Paul's own encouragement from seeing the gospel be made manifest in these two lives. In our previous point, we address repayment. But there's also a principle here if you are the one granted forgiveness. You can forgive when you understand the debts you yourself owe. Like we said before, how can you repay the person who first brought the gospel to you? In addition to that, how can you repay your disciples who have sanctified you? How can you repay your closest friends who have borne some of your deepest burdens? How can you repay those who have forgiven you for your own sins? How can you repay your pastors for bringing God's words to you? How can you repay your family for loving you despite your deepest flaws on this display? Above all, how can you repay God for his own grace and mercy? The reality is, if we look at ourselves, there are many spiritual blessings that God has freely given to us through other people. And we are the people we are today because so many people have poured into ourselves freely and lavishly. But we cannot ever hope to repay them. We are indebted to all of them. But when you understand that, well, maybe, maybe it also helps you to recognize that someone can, for, that you can forgive someone, and you, and and you can forgive someone who has wronged you as well. When I realize my debts to others, can I not also forgive others' debts to me? To learn what Paul writes, perhaps by doing so, you will find that there is benefit for yourself, and you can refresh those around you. Human eyes, forgiveness is not natural, but it helps to understand our own indebtedness. The third acknowledgement is an acknowledgement of obedience. Verse 21 opens, confident in your obedience, I write to you. In the moments, in Philemon's shoes, when Onesimus first shows up on your doorstep with this letter, I'm sure your first instinct is not to forgive. Like I said before, we are all sinners, and our natural inclination is not just to accept them right away. It's probably put back to challenge and to say, hey, Onesimus, what is your problem? And Paul knows that too. So he, he again reinforces his encouragement. He says, I'm confident in your obedience. Every four years, if you guys are anything like me, you find yourself glued to the TV, watching 
the Olympics. And what I think of when I read this verse is that athlete who realizes the moment they've been training for their whole life is about to happen. They realize they have the eyes of the world watching them, and they're just thinking about everything that is at stake. And so just about just as they are about to step on that balance beam or jump onto those uneven bars or take their take off of their job, their coach comes and pats them on the back and says, I'm confident that you will not only succeed, but you will take and that you will take gold, but you are going to shatter that record. And that's how I see Paul acting too. He's not trying to be a dominator of us or an authoritative apostle. He is like a coach trying to instill a sense of assurance in Philemon. Reminding him, yes, I'm asking a lot of you, but I'm also confident, and I know that you are capable of obedience. I've seen your character, Philemon. I know that you are a man of God. I know that the whole church is watching you. And this is kind of the time where you put all of that character to action. Before you even speak a word to Onesimus, remember, I am confident that you will forgive. We've said this over and over again. The situation is messy, and there's a lot of room for even more, even more difficulties to arrive. And so Paul prays of Philemon in such a way that he will not only be obedient to Paul's demands, but unto the Lord. He is not only confident that Philemon will obey, he believes that Philemon will exceed expectation. Latter part of verse 21, knowing that you will do even more than I say. And there's a lot of debate to what this phrase means. Some think that uh, Paul simply hopes Philemon will reject any kind of repayment and simply forgive Onesimus. Some take this to mean that Paul hopes that Philemon will simply grant Onesimus' freedom and no longer hold him back as a bond servant anymore. Maybe it means welcoming Onesimus back into his household and giving him a seat of honor at the table. Regardless of what it means, though, Paul is so confident in who Philemon is and his obedience that he knows that Philemon is going to go above and beyond expectations. And as we see in this, as we see in these verses, Paul is not manipulating Philemon or twisting his arm. He is making it clear that this is not a matter of something optional to do, but that's something he would like Philemon to do. But this is ultimately a matter of obedience. Forgiveness is ultimately a matter of obedience. In Matthew 18, when Jesus tells Peter, you must forgive 77 times 7, Jesus was not making a suggestion. He was not giving an extra credit assignment. Jesus was giving a command. Forgiveness is something required of us because we cannot love God and worship Him properly if we are at odds with another person or harboring grudges. When we say we follow Christ, we try to follow His commands in all we do. Christ has always made it clear that we are called to forgive. And understand this, withholding forgiveness should not be an option for us. Withholding forgiveness should not be a consequence. Sin is ultimately dealt with in two consequences. It is either punished for an eternity in hell, or it is poured out on the cross for Jesus to bear. And I know that many of us bear wrongs and burdens that way on the stage. And I have no place to say that I can relate to the pain you might be enduring. But I hope you understand that with only forgiveness will never get you closer to overcoming those transgressions. As hard as it might seem, I believe that embracing forgiveness is truly the first step towards healing. God calls us to obedience, not because he wants to control our lives, but because obedience to him is indeed a good thing. And when we withhold forgiveness, we are saying one of two things. We are saying that what was done to me was so heinous, so wicked, so wretched, that not even an eternity, the worst imaginable for condemnation can pay for it. Or we are saying that God, there's nothing you can do to appease what was done to me, not even the death of your own son. Forgiveness is a matter of obedience. And being disobedient to it reflects how little power the cross truly has on our lives. In human eyes, forgiveness is not natural, but it does not change the fact that God still requires it. That's the third acknowledgement, acknowledgement of obedience. 
And the fourth acknowledgement now we have is the acknowledgement of the body. The acknowledgement of the body. And in these final three verses, and we see that in verses 23 and 24. In these final three verses, Paul begins to wrap up the epistle. And in typical Pauline fashion, he ends it by mentioning greetings from his other co laborers in history and gives a parting benediction. And typically, it's really easy to gloss over these epistolary endings and say, well, that's it. And we just skim past it quickly. But I think in these three verses, there is still a lot we can learn about forgiveness. Verses 23 and 24. A pastor, my fellow prisoner of Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Stephen, and Luke, my fellow workers. These are all faithful friends of both Paul and Philemon, all part of a tight-knit fraternity laboring in the name of Christ. And it wasn't, yes, Paul does mention them because they do send us their greetings, but this is not just a passing comment. These greetings reveal that this is not a private matter between Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. But this is a corporate matter. All these friends are reading this letter too, and they are instantly familiar with the matter. They fully affirm what Paul is writing. And I think this is done to show that forgiveness is not an isolated matter, but a community matter. Forgiveness is not an isolated matter, but a community matter. They all agree with Paul, and hopefully the collective weight of their appeal as well will also help encourage you, Kelly. They're here mentioned to walk alongside you, to hold you accountable as you forgive. They're here to help mediate, offer counsel, encourage you, and exhort you as you and Onesimus begin that path of reconciliation. And not only that, but besides these individuals, this letter was meant to be read out loud to the church so that the church would know in the same same guide both Philemon and Onesimus mending the relationship. Forgiveness is never an easy choice to make, but God gives means of grace along that journey. And one of them is simply the company of other brothers and sisters. One of the advantages of bringing these matters before the council of other wise and godly people is that many of them have walked the same, if not harder, path of forgiveness. Like we said before, forgiveness is also a matter of obedience. And so having people around you helps make sure that on the one hand, the transgressor is working towards repentance, and on the other hand, that you too are taking the steps to forgive and to reconcile. That's one of the main reasons why we have the church as well. Our unity as a body is meant to reflect the image of Christ. And our goal is to be presented as a pure and holy bride. So if there's any lingering conflict or sin that could threaten that image, do not keep it amongst yourself. Bring it before others in your small group, or bring it to your friends, bring it to the elders. The body is here to help you, to help men bridges, to intercede for one another, to encourage one another. Do not ever feel like you are on your own when it comes to forgiveness. There is a reason why God has always had his people dwell in communities with one another. The large part of that is that the Christian life is filled with many challenges, such as forgiveness. And having a community around us gives us importance to them. In human eyes, forgiveness is not natural, but we can turn to the people around us to help. That's the fourth acknowledgement, acknowledgement of the body. The fifth acknowledgement is an acknowledgement of grace. An acknowledgement of grace. And this is a powerful benediction here in verse 25. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. As Paul signs off this letter, after the entire case he has laid out, he wishes for the grace of Jesus Christ to accompany Philemon. Verses 23 and 24, Paul reminds Philemon of all his friends who are accompanying him, uh, who are accompanying him in this grace to forgive. But in verse 25, he reminds him the best of friends. You have no better friends still than God's grace. When all your other friends may desert you, you have this one friend still. And if you are in Philemon's shoes, as you have read this whole letter, these are not just filler words parting off. So these are not just filler parting words to sign off on this letter. I think this verse serves as Paul's final punctuation that forgiveness is ultimately an act that requires grace. If we try to find it in our own strength to forgive, if we try to find it in our own capacities, it is always going to be a long and challenging battle, a battle we will likely never win. 
We need to draw on the grace of Jesus Christ if we are to ultimately forgive. That is the support we need. In human eyes, forgiveness is not natural, but in human eyes, do you know what else would seem unnatural? What seems unnatural is that Jesus, the eternal king, robed in riches, would condescend to this lowly earth in the form of man. That Jesus, despite living an innocent life of perfect obedience, would submit himself to an unjust execution reserved for thieves and murderers. That as he died on the cross, Jesus would be willing to receive the holy wrath poured out from his father. That the tomb enclosed with Jesus' crucified body would open up empty three days later. That Jesus would rise again from the dead, conquering death and sin once and for all, like no other man has. That through Jesus, a perfect righteousness now comes to us, not by works, but freely bestowed to sinners on the basis of faith alone. By our own intuition, none of these things should add up. In our, in our own estimation, none of these things should make sense, but Jesus comes to be a supernatural Savior. And that is a message of grace. In human eyes, only sin is what's natural, but Jesus saves us from it. In human eyes, grace is never deserved, but Jesus pours it onto us freely. In human eyes, forgiveness is not natural, but it is at the very nature of who Jesus is. And now he pours it out his spirit and enables us to walk in that very same nature. He bears our burdens with us. He dwells in union with us. And when we understand the riches of grace that Jesus has bestowed to us in the gospel, we will find that we have all we need to forgive. When we turn to him in humility, we will find all the divine enablement we need to pardon even the most gravest offenses that against us. This letter to Philemon is a striking reminder that if you are in Christ, that which God calls for, he provides. If you are in Christ, that which God calls for, he will always provide. That includes the strength to forgive. Grace enables you to look into the eyes of the one who hurt you and say, I forgive you. Grace is what allows you to say, I choose not to remember the wrong you have done. Grace is what allows hostile enemies to now be reconciled as brothers and sisters. Yes, in human eyes, forgiveness is not natural, but Jesus provides us supernatural strength. In these five acknowledgments, Paul makes opens the door for Philemon to respond as graciously as possible. They are clear evidences that God will always provide that which he calls us to. And these acknowledgments give us practical insight into how forgiveness works in real life. The church. And before we sign off, we are now we are left to the question bugging us all. What happens? Did Philemon ever forgive Onesimus? Well, scripture is silent. But what we do know is that immediately after the apostolic age, our early church fathers were diligent in maintaining, preserving, and replicating what they considered to be the spirit-inspired scriptures. And many of these church fathers were likely based out of Colossae, where Philemon lived as well. And so I believe they would not have kept this letter if they had known that Onesimus and Philemon never truly reconciled. And fast forward about 50 more years, we actually do see one surviving story. A man named Ignatius produces the collect a writing called the Collections of Apostolic Fathers. And in it, he addresses a bishop named Onesimus who is now the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And it is likely that that Onesimus mentioned there is the very same Onesimus here in this book. And what a transformation that is, is like from useless to useful, from run runaway slave, now pastor. Not only that, later on, church history tells us that this Onesimus died being martyred for the gospel. As for Philemon, well, church history says he still stayed in Colossae, likely staying faithful to his character and to his church. But what we see is that Philemon also dies being martyred for the gospel. What we see is that these two individuals went from master and slave to fellow soldiers in Christ. From disputing over worldly losses now to dying together for eternal causes. <coughs> Both <clears throat> Philemon and Onesimus were powerful testimonies to the gospel. 
through their lives and into their last days. This letter, though small, changed their lives radically. And perhaps, perhaps this letter can change yours as well. We've all been hurt before. We've all been offended. I'm sure we've all had points in our lives where forgiveness just did not seem natural to us. But as this letter encourages us, as much of a hill as that can be to climb, we can overcome it. The reality is yes, sin is messy. Sin can damage relationships. Sin can cause layers and layers of destruction. Sin can ruin lives. But when you can understand the forgiveness that God has for you in Christ, and when you can draw on that forgiveness to reconcile with those who have wronged you, there's no limit to how God can use that for his glory, just like with these two individuals. Let's pray. Father, we come before you knowing that we have an immeasurable debt in our name, but that Jesus has paid that debt on our behalf. And we pray that we would be humbled by that debt every day, and that we would know, and that we would know to forgive our debtors as you have forgiven us. Far too often we have just disobedient to your call to forgive, but we ask for your body to strengthen us, your grace to enable us to do what may feel unnatural in our flesh. And we ask that Jesus would be our firm foundation. Our source of our hope and comfort for us to overcome even the greatest offenses done to us. Praise the Lord, Amen.